Hi, guys. Welcome to Real Food Recovery. We are so excited today. We have an icon in our presence. <laughs> and I have to tell her, it, it's Chef AJ. I'll do a spoiler alert. I have to tell her that, and all you too, the reason that we are even here having a podcast is because of her. She doesn't know it yet, but I'm getting ready to tell her my story, how I'm linked to her and how she has uh, linked to my recovery. So a couple of years ago, I was listening to one of her health summits that she puts on. That was the first time I had ever heard anything about that. That was the first time I had ever heard the expression SOS free. And I'm like, I, I got to listen more to this. There's something to this. And I've been on every diet known to man. And I had never heard this. And one of her speakers was Joan Ifland. And I learned about mirror neurons and about how recovery isn't just about the food. And it started my journey of, you know, a lifelong dieting to switch to recovery. So because of her two and a half years later, I'm deep in recovery. So I owe her a big debt of gratitude. And I'm just in awe of meeting her and just so, um, I feel so comfortable in her presence. She just is a very warm, approachable person. So we'll get more into that later. Uh, Jamie, do you want to embarrass her a little bit more? And <laughs> tell your connection. Uh, so I, you know, I do. I, Chef AJ, I have watched, gosh, 2017, I started watching Chef AJ and um, countless hours spent reviewing videos, reading books by authors she recommended, and doctors and lifestyle experts that she interviewed. I have leveraged what I've learned from her for years now, um, and it really has remade my health from the inside out. It was a dream, mm -hmm. really a dream come true to be interviewed mm -hmm. last year by you, Chef AJ. I can't believe it was a year ago, um, almost. And my goal today really is, is now to not only return the favor of how of how warm and, and gracious you were, but also to connect our viewers to the common passion that the three of us have for helping processed food, addicted and obsessed folks find their way out of addiction into recovery. So mm -hmm. let me, before I, I, I turn it over to, to Chef AJ, I just want to tell our viewers who don't maybe know her a little bit about who she is. Chef AJ has been devoted to a plant exclusive diet for over 43 years. She really has a huge record um, as far as plant based exclusive, excuse me, plant exclusive diet um, focus for that long. She was the host of television series Living Healthy, excuse me, Healthy Living with Chef AJ, which airs on Foodie TV. Chef AJ is a chef, a culinary instructor, professional speaker, and the author of the popular book Unprocessed How to Achieve vibrant health and your ideal weight, which chronicles her journey from an obese junk food vegan faced with a diagnosis of precancerous polyps to learning how to create foods that nourish and heal the body. Her latest best-selling book, Secrets to Ultimate Weight Loss, and she has received glowing endorsements. I'm a big fan of it myself. She was also the exclusive pastry chef at Sante Restaurant in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. where she became famous for her sugar, oil, salt, and gluten-free desserts, which use the fruit, whole fruit, and nothing but the whole fruit. These recipes can be found in her book, A Date with Dessert. And she has shared some of those recipes on her, um, on her show on YouTube as well. Mm -hmm. She has created the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, which has helped I would say at this point, thousands of people achieve the health and body they deserve. And is proud to say her IQ is higher than her cholesterol. And in 2018, she was inducted into the, the vegetarian hall of fame. So chef AJ, thank you so much for being here with us. No, yeah. thank you. It's a pleasure to be in the company of such beautiful ladies and Paige, I got to say nails and hair. Good job. <laughs> it's all about that <laughs> recovery second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so tell our viewers a little bit about your story and how you developed this mission and, and movement from it. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know if I, I intentionally like, you know, set out to develop a mission. I just know that I was addicted to processed food and I believe it is an addiction. A lot of people aren't comfortable with that words, especially a lot of doctors in the medical community mm -hmm. they say, well, it's not the same as drug addiction because, you know, there's no, there's no detox. Actually, I think there is a detox. Maybe it's oh, not for as sure. Yeah. I don't think it's as severe as somebody 
that, that maybe is going through hair with detox right. and say, well, you can't die of it. And you're right. You probably can't die of processed food addiction detox, but I think you can die of eating processed food because I'm pretty sure my brother did. Good point. The, the thing so is, is, my mom. You know, I, I was born in 1960, and I do believe that most of our parents are doing the best they can with the knowledge and awareness they had at the time that they raised us, and that most people, when they know better, they'll do better, except it's difficult when you're an addict. Even when you know better, it's still really hard to do better. So my mother was morbidly obese, and I think... And part of the problem is she loved these foods too. So, you know, how are you going to, as a parent, how can you eat things and then not give them to your children, right? I mean, it doesn't make sense. And also she was one of the few working mothers in the 60s. You know, when Murphy Brown came out, when was that in the 70s or 80s? Oh yeah. 80s, yeah. First, yeah. I mean, before then people didn't hear of single parents, but my mom was a single parent way before it was like cool or, you know, th there were. And so, you know, processed food is convenient. I will give it that, you know, it is a lot easier to open up a can, a box, a bottle or a bag or pop something in the microwave or go through the drive through than it is to cook meals from scratch. So it's not like she didn't know how because she was an excellent cook. But when she was working full time, you know, it was easier to stop it. McDonald's on the way home, for example. So I don't fault her for that or anybody for wanting to, you know, conserve time and energy. But the thing is, you know, the I did not know back then it was an addiction. I just know that this is what we ate. Mm -hmm. It was delicious. Not that we only ate that, by the way. I just want people to understand that we ate real food too. But that stuff, it's it just draws you in. And I think the earlier in life that you're exposed to it, the the harder it is to break that whether you want to call it a habit, addiction, a predilection, a preference, the, the longer you've been exposed to it. And so, you know, we just had all the treats that now I would like, I mean, I could not even think of feeding to myself or a kid, but, you know, for example, my lunch could have Ho-Ho's or a Suzy Q, you know, things oh, yeah. like that. Or mm -hmm. snack pack pudding or, you know, mm -hmm. soda. And a lot of parents think, well, these are, you know, we shouldn't deny our children things. These are pretty benign. And I don't think the research back then uh, showed that these foods are addictive, at least in some people. But see, what happened is some wonderful books came out in the last 10 to 15 years. And one of them was called End of Overeating by Dr. David Kessler. And he was the former head of the FDA. And he explained how the processed food industry knew that they were actually creating an addictive product. They didn't share this information with us back then, but they knew it. And that's why things are always get tested with, um, you know, live focus groups so that they can find the exact amount of sugar, fat, and salt to addict the average person's right. brain chemistry. And even if they're not addicting you, they want to make what's called the bliss point so that you like it and will be a repeat customer. And then Michael Moss came out with his best-selling book. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning author and um, journalist. He wrote Salt, Sugar, and Fat, How the Food Giants Hooked Us, and then followed it up with Hooked. And mm -hmm. these guys are I don't think, well, I know that Dr. Michael Moss says he's not a food addict. I think David Kessler, Dr. David Kessler may have struggled a little bit with his weight at times, but th this was just solid evidence that they knew that sugar, fat, and salt was addictive. And they put more of it in processed food, restaurant food than you ever would even as cooking for yourself at home. Mm -hmm. And so- I never heard of food addiction, but when I read these books, whether it's an addiction or not, I didn't want my brain chemistry messed up or my taste preferences uh, dictated for somebody else's profit. So I just got really mad and I stopped buying processed food. That's why I wrote my first book called Unprocessed because it didn't matter if it was vegan and from an ethical company, that wasn't right. the point. Right. I just said, no more, I'm not giving them any of my money. And so really yeah. I don't, I haven't eaten processed food or bought, and, and again, what's the definition? Because I I think processed almost is not a great word because the truth is, is if I take a can of salt-free chickpeas and put it in my food processor with lemon and garlic to make hummus, I'm processing it. Mm -hmm. We're talking about refining the foods. We're not mm -hmm. talking about, you know, taking a carrot and cutting it off or things like that because they're all food technically is processed. But I think better to say ultra processed food or refined food, because not all processing is bad. And unless we want to eat everything out from the ground, just like that, we all do process our foods. Right. It's the degree of processing. It's how it's processed. So Very when true. I learned that, I just stopped eating it because I just said, I'm not giving them my money because look what they did. They're, they're evil, as Dr. Jonathan would say. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So how did you come into you know, having the, the show, having your platform after the book, 
How did that happen? Oh, well, you know, the, the show came to be really because of the pandemic and I couldn't travel anymore. So I needed something to do to create a sense of community. But, but, you know, I had my own kind of like private platform, you know, I've always had my own, you know, groups of people that I would help with managing food addictions and Mm -hmm. and lose weight. And the book just, I feel gave me more of, you know, something like, yeah, you know, where people could not only know my story, but know my journey and how I felt about it. It was just easier. You know, when you have a book, it's a little easier if somebody listens to your book on Audible or reads it than trying to have to explain it to every single person that you encounter. So, so that's kind of what was the purpose of the book. Cause I was like, I already said this, I already said this, <laughs> read this book. It's right there <laughs> in black and white. Hmm. And, you know, when I, when I look at processed food addiction, right? Or as you say, you know, refined foods, ultra processed foods and recovery. It's something the three of us all strongly believe in. We, Paige and I talk openly about how much we've struggled and Paige and I really, we cover the gamut, right? So I always talk about this to the spectrum that we cover on real food recovery and why Paige and I partnered together. We partner because uh, we cover the spectrum of, of a food addict or someone who's obsessed with processed foods um, from someone who was maybe more like Paige, who who didn't necessarily wear their addiction on the outside, but but struggled with it day to day, in and out, the obsession, the compulsion, you know, trying to control themselves around. In her, in Paige's case, it was around processed desserts and and sugary foods. Mm-hmm. For me, you you know, and, and Chef AJ knows this well. You know, my my struggle was worn on the outside, right? Mm-hmm. Four hundred plus pounds, and and struggled all my life, and used food for comfort and ease and anything I could, all of my life. So we have a really um, passionate lens that we wear when we talk about this because we we know from all sides of the spectrum what it looks like to be in this, and I don't, I I, I guess condition is the right word. So, you know, what is your take, Chef AJ, on the momentum we're building around the awareness of mm-hmm. this condition? You've had, you've done amazing work. How right. are we doing? Yeah. And so thank you, because like Paige said, she found out about it through my podcast interviewing Joan Iflin. And mm-hmm. it's sort of like, you know, each one teach one. And the more people that know about this, the people that choose to accept this information or learn this information will have more avenues to find out about it. Because as I mentioned, there are some clinicians, medical doctors who don't believe in this as an addiction. But even then, I don't know anybody, especially anyone in the medical profession that actually thinks processed food is good, at the exception of a few dietitians that feel everyone should be able to eat everything everything in moderation. I mean, that is the biggest crock right there. I cannot stand that. (laughs) Oh my God, because moderation, first of all, has not worked very well in this country because if it's three fourths of our population overweight, but it certainly has never worked for an addict. And I like that you brought up the story of Paige because I've had people that I've worked with that didn't wear it on the outside. In other words, it didn't visually look overweight and like, what are you talking about? How do you struggle? Yeah, right. Because that, that craving that you have and the inability to put to eat just one, it, it, it it's still the same craving brain. It's still miserable. The same yes. And whether or not one person becomes a little bit overweight or one person becomes obese or one person doesn't gain weight at all, it's nothing to do with their, their, you know, their worth as a person or all it has to do with is their genetics because people will become different weights on the same diet regardless. And so Mm -hmm. so the people that are not overweight, maybe I don't want to say in some ways struggle more, but they struggle differently because it's almost like they can't get anybody to believe them because, but who, who, how do we know the state of their arteries or how much, you know, um, visceral fat they have lining their internal organs. So I think they do suffer, even though we can't see their suffering. Right. So it, you know, people, unless I think, I think it's the kind of thing that almost like, and you know, they always say, if you got it, you can spot it. If people aren't sensitive to this and not everybody is sensitive to the effect of processed foods. My skinny husband, while he chooses not to eat processed foods very often, he could eat them exclusively mm-hmm. and he's going to stay skinny, whether he will stay healthy. I don't mm-hmm. know, but it's like me and alcoholism <laughs> or drug addiction. I personally don't like alcohol and I've never tried the kind of drugs that people that are addicted to drugs might get addicted to like heroin, cocaine, you know, methamphetamines. I don't choose to use those, but I would never say that alcoholism and drug addiction isn't real just because I personally, AJ, 
don't partake in those substances. And exactly. I think what happens is because there are people that can drink alcohol in varying amounts and never become alcoholic. But if you're an alcoholic, it's probably not you. And similarly, you know, there's, a, there's an old saying in toxicology, the poison is in the dose. There are people that can eat processed food in certain amounts or even in large amounts and mm-hmm. don't have that same kind of like, oh, I got to have it all the time. Mm-hmm. My husband, for example, I lived with him, you know, for 30 years. He can go out to a restaurant and have a rich vegan meal and some rich dessert. And then next day it's back to his vegetables for breakfast. He mm-hmm. doesn't, he, but there are other people that can't switch it on and off. And so I think the most important thing in any discussion about any kind of addiction is you have to know yourself. And that's why I don't like exactly. these one size fits all programs that say everybody must weigh and measure their food on the plate and everybody must have. No, because we're individuals and our vulnerability to the effects of these processed food varies. And, and, and again, not every substance is as addictive to everyone in the same amount. So for example, like I always thought I was a sugar addict because I started every day with Coke Slurpees and drank Dr. Peppers. But when I really <laughs> look back, it really was the sugar fat combination. And so mm-hmm. while, I would, while I would not choose to drink a Slurpee now, I think it would probably make me sick, the chemical taste. Mm-hmm. It's really the sugar and the fat that I can't stop eating. Not, not that I would want to have Twizzlers or gummy bears, but I don't think they would light up my circuits the way it does when sugar and fat is put together. And one of the things I learned from reading The Pleasure Trap is we weren't at, meant to activate the dopamine pathways of sugar, fat, and salt at the same time. It never occurs in nature. There is no food in nature that has sugar and fat together, that has sugar and salt together, that has fat and salt together, and certainly that does has sugar, fat, and salt. Mm -hmm. That is exactly what processed food and restaurant food is. And so, I mean, if somebody said to me, you know, I'll give you, you know, a certain amount of money for your favorite animal charity to eat a Twizzler, I would eat it. I don't think I would have a problem. I mean, I wouldn't like it. It's going to be chemically, but but sugar itself, it isn't the trigger for me. You have to know your, your triggers because it's really, you know, and also, you know, there are people that, that, that can have a slice of like a pacha bread or something, you know, that's made of literally one ingredient buckwheat and not be a problem so a lot of times it's the degree of processing and it's also it's also the quantity and so 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 you have to know what what bothers you you know one of the things that drives me crazy in the world that i work in the plant-based world is all these wonderful doctors insisting you gotta have nuts nuts and seeds or you'll drop dead well most of the people i work with myself included nut seeds and nut butters are huge triggers and that's what i love about dr goldhammer and dr iflin who actually together did an interview on on my channel that mm-hmm. you know, if it's a trigger for you, the best amount is none. You can't mm-hmm. learn to moderate a food that you, I mean, I don't want to say you can't, let me just say, I'm sure there's going to be this person out there that says, well, you know, I, I was an alcoholic and I can drink moderately then, you know, okay, that's great. But most people I know, and I have worked with thousands individually and even more in groups, if they struggle with a certain food, if it's an addictive food for them, even a gateway food, it it might not even be a food that they're addicted to, but it's a food that leads to the consumption of other foods. So for example, like, okay, corn tortillas, there's certain foods that are kind of in a gray area. Mm -hmm. Some of us can eat them, some of us can't. Mm -hmm. So I can have a corn tortilla, you know, and have like a Mexican meal. It's not a problem. But then you take it and you bake it into a chip, even if it doesn't have salt and oil, (laughs) it's like, well, now it's a little bit different. Or then you take it and you dip it into guacamole. Well, now it's a little bit different, but now that I'm having chips and guacamole, boy, that margarita would be good. So, you know, the thing is, is is people have to know themselves because that's why you, I think the, I think the bigger umbrella is sugar, flour, and alcohol for most people. Okay. Mm. For most people. But that said, I've known people that on their birthday can have a couple sips of champagne and not, but, but if you can't get right back on with the next bite of food, you might want to consider abstinence as a way of life, but it's yes. so hard. I'm sure you ladies know that for so many people, it is not a viable solution, not because it's not the best solution, but because they can't do it. So that's where things like harm reduction come in. And that's why it, this is such a difficult problem to that. solve because unlike cocaine and heroin and methamphetamine, amphetamine and alcohol and cigarettes, which you don't ever have to have to have a happy life. And in fact, I would argue that your life is less happy with those substances. <laughs> you can't abstain from all food the rest of your life. However, people can make a decision like the three of us had to abstain from processed food. Mm-hmm. Yes. Do you think that message is gaining momentum? Do you think it's getting out there? Do you think it's picking up speed? 
I think I think the processed food industry doesn't want it to, but I think for those <laughs> those that are shouting it from the rooftops of people like you ladies and Dr. Joan Iflin and Dr. Vera Tomran, Dr. Robert Lustig, Dr. Ellen Goldhammer, from people that 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 have always believed it, if these people are listening to it. But I think it's not a message that people want to hear a lot because they've raised their kids eating these foods and mm-hmm. they don't want to deny their children at the, you know, well, what do I do if I can't give them goldfish clack crackers? Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's what they're serving Krispy Kreme at the soccer games. And I don't mm-hmm. want my kids to be different, but I think part of it is the parents are so addicted themselves that mm-hmm. that's, you know, and they, it, it, it's such a complicated thing because people have been doing this for such a long time. Processed food, has become so readily available. And I say that because you cannot even go to a fabric store, a hardware <laughs> store, or no. now get this, a pet <laughs> store, a pet store. Why is there candy at Petco? I do not know any species uh, that's not human that is supposed to eat candy. So it's insidious. It's everywhere. You cannot get away from it, even if you keep your home clean. And it's also so cheap compared to whole natural food. And mm-hmm. it's socially acceptable that it's really hard to um, to be different sometimes. You know, I like sure. how Dr. Goldhammer says we live in a world designed to make us fat, sick, and miserable. And that's who most of people's friends are. So it, it can be, even if they have the information, you know, knowing and doing is two different things. And I think I'm learning. It's just for most people, it seems to be incredibly hard to yeah. make the switch to yeah. get rich. Yeah. You're, that was a great point you made about even at Petco, there's candy bars. Why? Because they're money makers. Why? Because yeah. we're all addicted. Obviously, mm-hmm. they wouldn't have the candy bars right. there if they weren't making money off it. They would take that shelf space and give it to something else that was making money. So that's a sad scenario. You know, you have coached and counseled probably thousands of folks in your career. What do you think is your most important piece of advice for those in recovery from processed food addiction? Well, my most important piece of advice, which is the piece of advice I got when I was early in recovery from my friend and psychologist, Dr. Doug Lyle, is a piece that a lot of people uh, don't want to hear because it's difficult. And that is to work harder on your environment than you do yourself, especially if you're early in recovery. Like me, I'm, you know, gosh, I'm tw- almost 20 years in, a, in, a, in about 10 days, I'll be 20 years off sugar. And so you could probably parade things in my house and I, I wouldn't be triggered by it. Mm-hmm. But I have a saying that if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. Mm-hmm. And it's People know this when it comes to drug and alcohol addiction. If they get out of rehab, they are not supposed to keep those substances in their house. If mm-hmm. they're if they were a bartender, they're going to have to get another job. Just like me, I was a pastry chef, and I was told, "Well, if you want to recover, you got to get another job." And so mm-hmm. I did. And so there is no no greater gift that you can give yourself, or if you're a family member watching this, to the yes. one you love, than the gift of a clean environment, mm-hmm. at least for a limited time, to do an experiment to see if if it makes a difference. It's already so hard for that craving mind to uh, to turn these foods down, you know, based on just, right. you know, seeing it out at a restaurant or on a billboard or on a commercial. You don't want to have it in your house. And if you're a parent, you don't want to be if your kids are already addicted, you don't need to be their pusher. Mm-hmm. That's right. Well, two things that come two things come to mind. One is we're, you know, and this is from right from Dr. Jonah Flynn's research too, and we talk about this all the time and so do you when you're out in the world and you're constantly being cued and triggered by the food, by the smells, by the sights, by other people eating it, your mirror neurons are engaged. You're thinking about it. You're, and and if you, if you're able to resist that all day, right. As an, as a food addict and you go home and that food's available in your home and nobody's around to see you eat it or, or choose it, or your family is, is, is endorsing it with their other choices. They're, you're toast. No pun intended. That's it. Absolutely. No well, toast is one of the big yeah. triggers for people because bread is difficult enough but <laughs> yeah, when so. you toast it, because then you not only have the visual cue, but you have the auditory cue of the t- crunchiness of the toast mm-hmm. and the smell yeah. because bread doesn't smell as much as, except when it's toasted. Yeah. But, you know, I yeah. always tell people if, if you have it in your house, it's not a matter of if you will eat it only right. when a lot of people Absolutely. try to taunt me saying I'm wrong. Like Esther Loveridge, who lost 140 pounds. She said, I'm just going to keep the seas candy and I've had it here for years and I'm going to show chef AJ she's wrong. And I, in, in, until the day that she ate it, I, I, I have not seen anything else happen. I mean, there, there could be a section, like if you're allergic to like, I'm allergic to soy, for example. So if my husband had a soy chocolate bar, I'm not going to eat something that I'm allergic to, or if I really hated it, like 
what do I hate? I, I can't think of it. But but the point is, you know, there may be a few workarounds, but why torture yourself? Aren't right. you tortured enough? You have to have a clean environment. And, and it's just, it, just try it and see the difference it makes. That to me makes it so much easier than totally. always. Willpower is a, is a limited resource. And as the day Absolutely. wears down, your 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 willpower dwindles. And like you say, you've been out all day. Maybe your boss yelled at you. Maybe your dog got sick. Car accident. You come home, and especially if you haven't um, taken care of yourself by eating whole natural food in a great enough quantity that day. Believe me, you're going to find that ice cream that you thought you hid in the bottom of the freezer. Mm-hmm. For but it's, it's going to be there. I had a friend that was an alcoholic, and you know she still kept wine in her house for company. Right. company. Right. Yeah. She was her own company, you know? Right. Right. He was her own best friend. Yeah. Well, and it also reminds me of, you know, when you interview Dr. Furman and he talks a lot about raising his, his children and how his kids used to say, Oh, if you don't let me go to this party and eat this, this birthday cake or eat this, this junk food at this party, you don't love me. And he and his wife were very clear about, Hey, it's because we love you that we're Mm -hmm. telling you that these are, these are the choices. If you make these choices, these are the consequences of your choices. Right. And, and it's because we love you that we're educating you and that we're sharing this with you. And we're letting you go and decide what's, what's best for you. It has nothing. It is the opposite of what you think. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And it's not, it's not, I'm not telling parents that they, their kids can never have these treats, but I'm saying, if you, the parent is the food addict, they have to eat these outside the house. They have to yeah. have enough respect yeah. for you. And you have to have enough love and respect for yourself that you have to either demand it or negotiate it because everything can be negotiated. Yeah. You know, it's just, Absolutely. it's just sad yeah. to see you know, the way that they, they fight or they don't even fight. They don't even ask. They don't even think they're worth it to ask for a clean environment. Oh, my husband works so hard. He deserves to have the crap. Mm. Okay. Then, you know, good luck recovery. You know, if, if somebody out there can show me a proven path to recovery, well, keeping a, an unclean environment, then please let me know. I'll rewrite my book, but I'm guessing if that's the case, then you really weren't as addicted as you thought. Yeah. Exactly. You exactly. know, in my house, my husband has a cupboard where everything that, cause he, he doesn't eat like I do. He has, I mean, he eats well, but he also has his processed things. And our agreement is you have a cupboard that's high up. He's six, six. And so I'm five, two, it's the highest cupboard. It takes effort for me to get in there. And I don't go in there unless I'm jonesing for trouble. And, uh, I, fully believe what you said about keeping a clean environment. We had a family here for several days and I was fine the first couple of days. This, the last couple of days I of looking at that, it was the salty stuff. I have a hard boundary around sugar, but I found my hands trickling into that, those salty snacks because they had been speaking to me. So by day three, day four, my defenses were, uh, they were dwindling. Right. Yeah. So there's only so much strength, as you said, uh, willpower is a limited resource. And exactly. I certainly experienced that this weekend. Exactly. Exactly. Chef AJ, you've created an online community that is educated, compassionate, and very engaged. That's no small feat, especially in, in this, the times we live in with all of the people sort of competing for our attention. You give a lot. So, so much of yourself to others, your time, your passion, your experience. What fills your cup? Hmm. Puppies. No. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> no, I just, I, you know, I, I, I think, you know, there's an old saying healthcare, self-care is healthcare. So I just, just doing anything fun. I do stand up comedy. I take classes all week. Oh. Improv comedy. I perform it, but really just, you know, my little dog right here, she's just, now I think about Edith Wharton. What was that thing? Heartbeat, heartbeat at my feet. I, she just, oh. Oh my God. I just, I love my dog, my, whatever dog I have, I love But Right now it's Bailey and, and that fills me up and we do volunteer work together and just spending time with her and my husband, but just, just doing fun stuff. You know, I think that uh, I always tell people like, you know, especially if they're addicts, get a hobby, do, you know, something knit do something with your hands because you can't be putting food in your mouth. If you're knitting, right. you know, I don't know how to knit. We'll learn how to knit and learn. I, I live in a warm climate. I don't want to wear anything. We'll make it for little babies in the ICU. I learned how to knit. And I live in Houston, Texas right now. So <laughs> I, I have no, and everyone made fun of me. They're like, why are you knitting? What are you knitting? A scarf? I'm like, damn right. I'm knitting a scarf because it keeps my hands busy. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Start a podcast. Exactly. Absolutely. Start a Absolutely. podcast. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. 
You've awesome. come so far in your clean food journey. You have mastered the whole food plant-based SOS free lifestyle. Are there things you're still working on in your recovery? Do you think you'll ever reach the finish line? Does that make sense? Let me Do think. You you ever, have you ever arrived? Well, I, I don't ever like to get too uh, cavalier in, mm -hmm. you know, because I don't like to just think that, oh, wow, it's been this many years. And so I'm, I'm cured or whatever. I don't think you really cure an addiction, you manage it. But I do think, yes. you know, that um, as time goes on, that I, I'm able to maybe eat a few things. When I say a few things, I'm not talking about like unhealthy things, but like, for example, I pretty much avoid salt, but like very early on, I was much stricter, but if there's some salsa in the house that has salt, like the world, like I don't get triggered by, by little things like I used to. And that's why I think it's always also good for people to run experiments because mm -hmm. maybe, you know, instead of, you, you know, you can try things out in a safe and controlled way. I work when anytime I test something out, I test it with my psychologist, Dr. Doug Lyle, when I tried to reintroduce <laughs> those whole food fats and immediately it was just like, Oh my God, I, yeah. oh, I got to have a lot and look at my weight go up. No, no, no. That, 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 that was a, not a mistake. I'm glad I did that experiment. Um, but I just, I just, I remember what it was like before. And I remember what it, I know what it's like now. And I prefer the way I feel now, mainly because it's like Dr. Rifflin talks about this calm, stable brain. It's yeah. not even so much that I find, you know, I think that, you know, weight loss and food addiction, they're kind of like opposite sides of the same coin. And that if you treat the food addiction, the weight will come, the weight will come off, you know, eventually. And I think that um, what, what's interesting is that I just, remember even early on before I lost my weight, just giving up these substances, just feeling so much calmer and not having cravings, that felt really, really good to me than always, you know, thinking about what my next treat was. And, you know, I, I just didn't like, I didn't like the feeling of being an addict. I just didn't like it. And mm -hmm. I think that as long as I just know that as long as I stay away from those foods, I'm going to be fine. And so I, I'm really at the point now where I look at them not even just as an addiction, but almost like an allergy. Like I have food allergies mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter how much I like soy and black pepper. I don't like black pepper, but that's one of my allergies. But I used to like soy before I found out I was allergic. You know, it's not worth it because it's I'm gonna, it's going to make me sick. And so mm -hmm. I look at those foods kind of like I would look at rat poison, you know, like that's also a white powder. Like I see a skull and crossbones. And so I can look at a rich you know, piece of tiramisu and go that, you know, the artistry, I, I remember that used to be delicious, but it's, it's just, I think the longer you, you, you can go, the longer the period of abstinence, the more grounded you get in it and almost like the easier it becomes. Cause I don't think about it. I mean, it's, I'm 20 years into it. I don't think about Coke Slurpees or Dr. Peppers <laughs> once in a while. Like I'll get a weird craving, like for not, not for a rich dessert, but for some reason, like black licorice, I don't know why, but you know, I, I don't want to eat it because I got TMJ, but I think that you know, I just, I don't want to get too cocky and say like, I'm cured. I'm better uh, because I, I know that it can come back and bite you in the ass. Anytime. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. Absolutely. You know, I saw one of your posts today or something it popped up on my news feed about you were making good, Goodman nut. Yeah. And the funny thing is, is this is the weird thing. I can make that stuff and not want it and not eat it. Yeah. So this yeah, is, I'm, I'm like, how does thing. she do that? I know how, well, I would eat the whole pan I'm of that because I'm, that I'm really lucky that, um, I, I don't want to say I'm allergic to chocolate, but I haven't had chocolate in like 15 years. Cause it yeah, gives to... migraines. And so well, it, it's well. not I, something that I know that, I mean, I remember my last migraine. I remember I had a chocolate truffle, a vegan chocolate truffle without refined sugar. And then that's when the doctor made the connection of histamine foods or something. So, so that it's not, like I said, if I'm allergic to it, it's not a problem for me. I, th I still think chocolate smells good. And it's not like I'm working with it every day. I was testing a recipe, but also the other thing is, is it doesn't stay in the house. I tested the recipe on a day, an hour before going to a meetup with 50 people and boom, it's gone. <laughs> it doesn't stay. I do. If I make something, it doesn't stay in the house. Believe me. If, if it's not something that I feel like I can eat in abundance and regularly. So it mm -hmm. wasn't really a problem. Yeah. But I probably couldn't have done that 20 years ago, you know, but mm -hmm. never, I can take a, and believe me, if it wasn't for the fact that I was writing a dessert book, I wouldn't even be doing any of this because I don't <laughs> I don't want to do that, but it's hard to write a book if you don't test the recipes. So you, you don't have a problem with people making mock desserts with. See, this is going to be an individual thing because for me, um, 
I look at it as good, better, best. And not everybody in the world is willing to desert dessert permanently, but I still think it's possible mm-hmm. to have delicious desserts without oil, sugar, flour, and salt. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. this is where people have to know themselves because I find that sometimes some people, if they are too restrictive, mm-hmm. then they will really fall off with, in the worst way with the worst desserts. And that's why I make I the case that some of the desserts I make, while they may be calorically dense, are still made from foods with actual nutrient fiber, vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, antioxidants. And you would probably be better eating that than eating a Cinnabon, for example. Yeah. This is where Because not everybody can just draw that hard absence line and say, I'm never going to have this again. And so that's kind of where I feel like my desserts fit. Um, some of my desserts are basically just like, okay, so like people, I know a lot of people in the plant-based world eat uh, for breakfast oatmeal and they'll maybe put a banana in it. Well, that's a recipe in my book, except I bake it and now it's shaped like a cookie. <laughs> now for some people, that's going to be a problem because now it's a cookie. For mm-hmm. me, it tastes exactly like oatmeal and a banana. So I, I guess, again, people vary in how vulnerable they are to mm-hmm. effects of these processed food. But I do think sometimes the longer you've gone, you might have a little bit of wiggle room. Like I said, I didn't play with any of this at the beginning. You know, I'm, yeah, I'm smart. so many years out. And also the funny thing is, is the foods that call to me now, when I say call to me, nothing really calls to me in a craving way, but I have become a person that prefers savory foods to sweet. I, I mean, mm-hmm. the first three, three years of my life, basically all I ate is dessert. And yep. now when given a choice, it's not that I dislike the taste of sweet and I have a lot of fruit here and I love it, but I'd rather eat something more savory like yep. vegetables and potatoes. It's just mm-hmm. That's who I have become, which is also very unusual. And even things that are sweet, I need them dialed down. I need them less sweet. So it's really funny. I have this love-hate relationship with bananas because I use very ripe bananas when I'm making desserts. But if Mm -hmm. I'm going to eat a banana, I've got like a 12-hour period before it gets too (laughs) sweet for me. And it's so funny because I just bought bananas. Yeah, they were green at the tip and I'm eating one for dessert. We actually had our team meeting. So I'm eating my banana. I'm like, oh my God, this is so sweet. So I ate it with some romaine lettuce because the banana was too sweet for me. And you would never have thought that could have happened to somebody that was having, you know, 48 ounce Dr. Pepper big gulps. But I think the less you you know, assault your taste buds with sugar, fat, and salt, the the less you don't need as much to experience the sweetness in things like fruits and vegetables. I love your common sense wisdom, especially when it comes to if you find that you are someone that is very triggered by feeling so restricted, then then let's, let's find some common ground here that can make, keep you from going off the deep end, because I think so many people suffer from that. They're just white knuckling it, even skill power, all that it's still white knuckling. And then you have a slip and it's Oof, Katie well, that, you know, if you guys haven't listened to the Beat Your Genes podcast by Dr. Doug Lyle, episode 161, especially if you're working with people can be very beneficial because he talks about this concept called the ego trap, which is a little bit different than the pleasure trap. Because the thing is, is for some people, if the bar is set too high, and, and again, there are recovery programs, not yours, but other ones would say, you know, if you have one sip of this, you're out, you failed, you're not gonna mm-hmm. be able to speak at the next meeting, you're no good, blah, blah, blah. Well, when the bar is set too high, especially too mm-hmm. early for people, there's this phenomenon called the ego trap where they purposely fail, they kick over the table because they know they can't reach it. And that's why this has to be a little bit more individual. You can't paint everybody that's with the so same smart. brush. Oh, and, so you know, smart. I think a good rule is, especially early in recovery, no sugar, no flour, no alcohol. That's a, probably a pretty good rule if you think you're suffering from that. But to tell everybody that they have to do the same thing in the same amount, that's crazy because people are individuals. They have different stressors in their life, different mm-hmm. times of their life, they'll have stress. But for some people, if abstinence is too hard, then we got to find something that you can do, right? Brilliant. The, the problem that I see is because most people are coming to me just for weight loss, not even understanding that there is such a food as food addiction. That's why I have a quiz in my book to see how addicted you are. And so what they'll want to do is they'll, they want to be really skinny, but they don't want to do the steps that, it, you know, to, that they have to get there. So, so there's like a mismatch between what they say they want and what and they're what willing to do. Mm-hmm. So I, I speak at these spas all the time and people will say, you know, oh, Chef AJ, I want to be skinny like you, except I want to be able to drink alcohol and have cheese, you know, blah, blah, blah. well, okay, good <laughs> luck. You know, so, so it's, you got to be realistic as to what your goal, first of all, what your goals are and what you are willing to do to achieve them in a realistic yeah. way. So, so that's the problem when people set the bike, 
far too high, especially when it's enforced by somebody. It's different if they want to do that, you know, right. they're told they have to do this and it's too hard. They, they often get into this place called the ego trap, which is just a horrible place to be. And so they, they have to find what works for them. And that's why sometimes working with an individual counselor that's skilled like Dr. Doug Lyle, or I don't know if you guys do private coaching can help if there's nothing wrong with experimenting with these foods and see if these are foods you have to eliminate decrease the consumption of or you know or figure something out or, or it but I will tell people that it's hard but for the people that have done it and can do it they always have said it's worth it oh, and then, mm-hmm. that for those of us that are able to get on that abstinence yeah. train we think abstinence is bliss because any deprivation that that people think we have it's it's made up for in all the other things we gain like a trim body like a calm stable brain like you know the only thing we're giving up is a life of craving disease you know ability so but but it's so hard because when people are in the throes of addiction they don't see that anything else is a possibility or that you know can, that can, you know, this is saying nothing feels, uh, nothing tastes as good as thin feels. Nothing feels as good as abstinence feels. Right. Yeah. I, uh, amen. Yeah. So, so true. And, you know, you said a couple of things too, Chef AJ, about is Paige and I, one of our most popular episodes so far in our very, very young podcast, um, Paige and I talk about being your own guru. And it, that's really what you're saying. It's, it's figuring out what works for you, but also being, you know, part of being a guru is figuring out what works for you from a very honest place, right? Like what is, what is really happening for, for me after I eat this food? What is really going on in my head? What are my cravings? Like, what are, what's my mood? Like, what's my energy level or my, my, you know, some other physical um, reactions, what is really happening here? And then noticing it and aligning to it allows you to figure out what's best for you that day, that point in your recovery, whatever it might be. So, you know, when I think about too, the fact that you've made over 2000 videos on YouTube, which is incredible. And you stream live Mm -hmm. every day you have since during the pandemic. Well, how many episodes live every day? Oh gosh, I'm I'm almost at 1600 for the live ones. 2300 count everything. Yeah. So you have put incredible passion into and effort into educating the public on the freedom, right? We we just talked about the freedom of that, that this lifestyle can bring them. At this point in your recovery, where's your passion now, AJ? Believe it or not, it's in comedy because I'm not getting any younger and it's really what I wanted to do. So I'm getting back into performing improvisational comedy and that's just you. what I love. You know, you got to have a passion. You I agree. Have a passion. Absolutely. Okay. Do you have your favorite joke? Do you want to lay a favorite joke on well, us? Well, well, okay. So, but see, improv, it's not about jokes. It's a collective. Oh. Shoot. You know, where people, well, I mean, do I have a favorite joke? Well, one that I can tell on the air. Let's see if I, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to make I, it be about food addiction, you know. Um, I, I have one. Do you want to hear one that I, I just heard recently? Sure. This grasshopper walks into a bar, sits up at the bar and the bartender says, what do you have? We actually have a drink named after you. And the grasshopper says, Steve. <laughs> That's <laughs> really cute. <laughs> That's adorable. <laughs> I love that. Do you yeah. have anything that can top that? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> are there are there in addition to the to the comedy and more importantly, you know, the the improv work, are there any new projects or or interests that you want to tell folks about that you've been doing? So I'm writing a new book and it's oh. probably not good for people that are hardcore food addicts because it is a dessert book, but it's all actually I had Dr. Nicole Lavina endorsed it. And uh, Dr. Michael Gorin wrote the introduction because the idea is, is that not everybody is going to dessert dessert for the rest of their life. So if we're going to have dessert, we're going to have one without any sugar, real or fake. So there's no stevia, low hand, mm-hmm. food, it's basically fruit. And I'm sure there's people that probably can't have dates. Not every recipe has dates. Some are made with apples or bananas and mm-hmm. there's no oil or salt. So I'm writing that. It'll come out in the summer of 2024. And we've got two other book ideas that I'll probably do after that. What else? I still teach classes. I still mm-hmm. do my, you know, I do the weight loss classes a couple times a year with, with some of the doctors. Those are valuable, like 30 day reboot programs, right? YouTube show every day. What else do what I do? You, how about outside of, outside of work, so to speak? How do you, 
you, you're building a social community in person. How oh my you- gosh. Yes. I forgot about that. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> so I moved from Southern California to Northern California a little over a year ago, just to have community specifically because I've been a vegan for almost 46 years and we couldn't find any in the desert. And so there's, I have a thousand people in my group, 6,000 in my friend's group. And we like, I mean, if I wanted to, if I didn't have to work, they get together every day because the oh restaurants here not only make vegan food, even when they're not vegan, but they make SOS free sugar, oil, salt, free food. So we have potlucks, we have meat. We just, it's, I mean, I've never had so many friends in my life and so many opportunities. And I always tell people, find your tribe and love them hard. Yes. If you are a food addict and want to stay in recovery, you've got to find like-minded people, especially if your friends and family are always pulling you down by eating those hyper palatable foods in front of you, bringing them to your house. Right. You've got to have a community, I think. And of course, online communities are great, but if you can find them in person, it's even more wonderful. Agreed. Connection is the opposite of addiction. That's very true. That's yeah, very I think true. so. I, yeah, because it's very, addiction really, I think mostly lives in the shadows in isolation. And it's very of course to, to do it when you're out in public and with a group of people. Absolutely. So final question, AJ, how can we advance as a, as a, as a community ourselves, mm-hmm. right? Online community ourselves that we, that we're working with you and, and, and others to, to band together, to advance the cause of PFA education and awareness <laughs> together. Me. It's funny because, you know, there's a saying, there's a saying, eat the change you want to be in the world or see in the world. Mm. And in this case, don't eat it. So in other <laughs> words, <laughs> give abstinence a try, or at least educate yourself, read books like the end of overeating, like salt, sugar, and fat, like hook, like Dr. Iflin's book, um, sugar and flour, how they make us crazy, fat and sick. You know, there's a lot of books out there now that explain that whether you eat sugar or not, whether you're overweight or not, that it's just not healthy. It, we really shouldn't be thinking of it as a food or as something to feed to our families. And anything anybody can make with sugar, I can make without, I can guarantee that. So mm-hmm. you really don't need it. There's no minimum daily requirement for processed sugars. It, it's just, it's bad. Whether you eat animals or not, nobody needs to be eating processed food, nobody. And just learn to cook, get an Instant Pot. You've got to eat your meals at home, really. Restaurant, mm-hmm. eating, eating. you know, I didn't. Oh, oh, the other thing early in recovery, I didn't eat at restaurants for like 10 years, right? Yeah. So yeah. triggered by all this stuff, but I can yeah. do that now, you know. Mm-hmm. I just make sure I don't go to one like with a big bakery case in front, right? Exactly. But you know, mostly I'm going to like Vietnamese restaurants, there's nothing triggering in for yes. me in a Vietnamese yes. restaurant, honestly. Ethnic, because- ethnic restaurants do very well. Certain ethnic restaurants yeah. do very well. Vietnamese is one of them. I agree. right because well, I like my I have a bigger problem with flour and, and you know flour products. I don't eat pasta, but this restaurant takes king oyster mushrooms, a julienne peeler, and he makes noodles. There's no other ingredient. It's mm. literally a mushroom, but the way he slices it, you think you're eating pasta, and I'm eating a mushroom. So I can do mm. things like that and and still yeah. enjoy it. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, we've enjoyed you immensely. If you don't mind, we've got three quick viewer questions that we would sure. like to ask. Um, and this kind of leads into the conversation we were just having. The first one is a life without sugar, oil, fat, alcohol, or salt sounds boring. Do you ever feel deprived? Well, first of all, it's not fat, it's flour because I oh, reckon flour, thank people you. have fat. Well, um, yeah, I feel deprived of obesity, <laughs> heart disease, of cancer, of diabetes, of food addiction. And so so the thing is, is if you're looking to your food to entertain you, then if you don't have hyperpalatable food, you may feel bored. But the purpose of food is nourishment. And if you eat to live instead of live to eat, you won't feel deprived, especially if you learn to fall in love with whole natural foods. Now, that doesn't happen right away. There's time that neuroadaptation has to occur. But listen, I had Coke Slurpees for breakfast. Now I can have Brussels sprouts for breakfast and enjoy it. But it didn't happen overnight. So you have to give yourself some time and away from these foods to learn to appreciate these whole natural foods. So maybe in the beginning I did, but the thing is, is I would actually only feel deprived if somebody else was eating it in front of me. So nobody in the last 10 years has eaten that stuff in front of me. So I don't feel deprived if I'm eating Brussels sprouts and he's eating, you know, his, he eats Christopher's crunch as his morning vegetable. So I I could see how that could happen this, you know, but no, I don't, but I I could see that it could happen if I was not in a clean environment for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Good answer. Yeah. Yeah. We had the question from a viewer made some of this. So I made some of the sofas free desserts, but I find they call to me. Yeah. So they're not for you 
they're not for you or they're not for you right now. So make a case that if you're somebody that if you feel like we talked about this ego trap, if you're somebody that when the chips are down and you have a bad day that you're going to end up going to McDonald's for their apple pie or their McFlurry, you could make a case that it's probably better to have these in your freezer if you're going to have something. But for some people early in recovery, they may not be something that you can um, have right now. They still would be a better choice for your family than giving them other foods. So again, this is where experimentation comes in. I also feel that a lot of times if people really eat enough high nutrient food first. So in other words, like it, I have this muffin called a cram muffin. It's it's oats and bananas and applesauce and carrots. It tastes like carrot cake, but it doesn't, it doesn't even have dates in it. But yeah, if you, if you start your day with that, it's going to be tough. But if you really have eaten a lot of vegetables and, you know, nutrient dense foods and beans and things like that, you may be able to have it, but how are you having it? That's the other thing. So what you can do is if you're somebody that really struggles, if you make these and let's say it makes 12, take 11 to the neighbors and then you have one because it's not like they're going to manifest quickly again. But I, but if, if again, when in doubt, leave it out. That's what I yeah. say. Exactly. Beautiful. Yes. And, and I love that you, that you remind us of the power of thylakoids of the, yeah. of the, uh, eating those greens first thing in the morning. Yeah. If you have yeah. those greens cut off your cravings for, for really overeating in general, but, but sweets in particular. So I ask you, like, if you say you're struggling with my desserts, did you just have vegetables first or did you have oatmeal first? You know? So I'd like to know that if possible. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think one thing that you told, I heard you say when I very f- first discovered you was you had like a pound of vegetables for breakfast yeah. or something like that. that and I'm like, I'm going to try to do that. I'm going to do that too. Yeah. So I started getting, doing a pound of salad every day. I don't do it for breakfast, but yeah. I do have a pound yeah. uh, of salad sometime during the day. Okay. Last question. I can't seem to break out of the binge cycle. What advice would you give me? Well, honestly, for somebody that is stuck in that binge restrict repeat cycle, I would really recommend them to Justina Froese. She might be a really interesting guest for you to interview. She's in Germany, so she's later, but she works with people individually. She broke herself of a I think it was a 15 year binge cycle. Generally, I find in and if there's an exception, let me know. But almost everybody that binges, it's because they're restricting. If you're not restricting, you're not binging. And so what happens is they maybe they set the bar too high, they fell off. And then so they're going to be good. So they're not going to have any starch or any satiating calories. They're just going to eat fruits and vegetables and they get really hungry. And then it just becomes this vicious cycle of binge, restrict, repeat. So in general, if you're suffering from binging, stop restricting, even if it makes, even, and stop weighing yourself, just let, let yourself normalize with that and maybe work with a professional that specifically focuses on that, like Justina. Exactly. Yeah. Great Justina. advice. Justina. Hmm. Okay. Great advice. I, I, I'm familiar with Justina and oh, good. her work, her work. Thank you. Well, Chef AJ, thank you for your time and your wisdom and your, your passion and the community that you're building online and in person. Uh, I think, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to talk with you again and to also be on your show. So thank you for also the fact that you get this, you know, what we're talking about, right? This process food addiction and the recovery process, that it is a journey. It is multiple years. It is, it is, it really will be a lifetime journey out of the addiction into discovering your new self and, and really getting freedom. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Freedom is possible, especially with the 4th of July coming up, nothing like (laughs) processed food. That's right. Thank you. That's right. Personally, thank you for what you've done for me in oh. my recovery journey. And I feel like I've made a new friend today. So oh, thank, thank you. you. Dave. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Take care. Take care. I'll see Bye. you on the next episode of Real Food Recovery. Bye-bye, guys.